this is your last chance. This is your moment to save your presidency. And I don't know if he's listening. Okay, Friedberg, we made some great progress in science this week in nuclear fusion. Do you want to tee this up for us? I'm happy to. So let me just give a little background for maybe a minute on, on fusion. So, you know, the, um, the way energy is made in the sun and in all stars is through this process of nuclear fusion where hydrogen uh, nuclei, the, the protons inside of hydrogen atoms shoot around at such a high energy and they're so dense because of the amount of hydrogen it all causes gravity to pull them all together and they get really dense. They start slamming into each other. When they slam into each other, they fuse into helium and ultimately into heavier elements and release energy in the process. And that is what fusion is. So, you know, we talk about nuclear energy on Earth. All nuclear energy that we've generated on Earth uh, as a species to date has been through fission, where we take much heavier elements like plutonium and uranium and br they break apart by squeezing them together and they release energy. But this creates radioactive material. It's dangerous. It's very, very expensive and so on. So the, the, there's always been a question since roughly the 1950s on whether or not we could cr recreate the conditions of the sun or stars on planet Earth by creating a plasma, by creating the same sort of plasma that exists inside of stars, very hot, very fast, very dense hydrogen that can slam into itself and slam into atoms and fuse into helium and release energy. Does that same plasma exist on Uranus? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God, you, you're going to give him a wedgie. Let science boy finish. Uh, Come on. <laughs> oh, sorry. Back to you. Never gets old. Never was it 69 <laughs> megajoules or 420 megajoules? Go ahead. Yeah. So plasma fusion has always been this kind of holy grail of energy because if you can actually generate plasma fusion, the amount of energy it takes to create the plasma is less than the energy that comes out of the plasma. So it's, it's effectively Net infi positive. In infinite, free, cheap plasma. And so the, the system that people have been building for the last 25, 30 years is these, uh, these donut-shaped systems called tokamaks. They're, they, they're like a a circle or like a donut and they spin the plasma around inside and so it takes a lot of energy and magnets and so on to try and make this work you know there's a company we talked about a few months ago called commonwealth fusion systems which uses a new superconducting material to control that plasma and use instead of using expensive magnets and they just raise 1.8 billion dollars and uh you know more recently uh, the joint um, European Taurus, which is managed by the, uh, the Atomic Energy Authority in the United Kingdom, uh, just this week demonstrated um, energy output uh, from their tokamak plasma fusion system, where they generated, you know, 59 megawatts of, of energy in five seconds, uh, which is um, a record. Uh, the prior record was set in 1997 by that same agency. They generated 16 megawatts uh, of power output. So it, it was a great breakthrough. And, you know, to make this all possible has required uh, technical breakthroughs in electronics, uh, technical breakthroughs in sensors and computing and hardware and material science and superconductors. And so all of this is starting to coalesce that plasma fusion might actually become a reality. And the ITER system, which is the biggest construction project in Europe, 35 nations have contributed a total of roughly 50 to $60 billion to make this system. Um, is, is going to go online around 2027. They've been building it for 20 years. It's going to be a 500 megawatt demonstration system. And if it works, then it opens up the door that in the future, we may actually be able to turn plasma fusion into an energy source for all of humanity. It basically would use water. Plasma fusion is made from taking hydrogen, which you would get from water, spinning it around, heating it up, getting it to be really, really dense, and ultimately driving power out of it. The implications are extraordinary, right? So over the next few decades, it is appearing more likely that we will have plasma fusion systems working on Earth. And as that happens, energy becomes free, and it becomes unlimited. And with unlimited free energy, we can terraform Earth, right? We can take uh, uh, ocean water, desal it, turn it into fresh water, we can pump that into deserts, turn them into rainforests. Um, you know, the total annual production of energy on Earth today is about 170 terawatt hours. That amount of energy could be generated from just a 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot cube of water. Um, that's the amount of energy, the amount of material that would be turned into photons that would drive all of the electricity we need on Earth. So it's an incredible technology and an incredible breakthrough. We're starting to see this stuff happen. One area that I wanted to kind of just highlight, which no one talks about, but which I think is extraordinarily um, important about 100 years from now, let's say. As these plasma fusion systems work, it's certainly going to be um, true that we'll have abundant free energy during the back half of this century. And that'll change everything. We'll decarbonize the atmosphere, we'll terraform the planet, we can make whatever we want, we can build things, etc. But 
The same system of plasma fusion theoretically could be used to fuse heavier elements than just helium. So fast forward 100 or 200 years, if we can actually make plasma fusion systems work, we could also, and to, to make helium, to make energy, we could also use them to make heavier elements, like the rare earth metals that we talk about being so important here on earth to make um, batteries. Or phosphorus, uh, which, you know, we're going to run out of on planet Earth in about 100 years, which is a critical component of agriculture and feeding ourselves. So, you know, over the next, call it 100 years, plasma fusion systems, I think back half of this century come online, provide us with abundant free energy. And then in the 22nd century, I think this idea of nucleosynthesis, the idea that we can actually make the rare earth or the heavier elements that are limited natural resources here on earth, where we could turn water into gold or water into lithium or water into molybdenum or, you know, into beryllium or whatever, um, starts to become a reality. Um, and so this to me, like, I, I feel like we're on the eve of plasma fusion being a reality, you know, based on some of the results we're seeing. And it's, it's one after the other. ITER is going to come online, you know, Commonwealth Fusion had their, their materials breakthrough and, and on and on and on. So this seems to be building up. And so the 20 and going to hit a tipping point. Yeah, that's right. I think the 2030s and the 2040s are where this becomes real. And all these problems and concerns we have about climate change, and carbon in the atmosphere, all of this stuff can be reversed with infinite energy. And so so I'm optimistic. I and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about a lot of what we're seeing. Let me ask you one question. Obviously, when people start hearing about nuclear reactors and fission, and then they start learning about fusion, they immediately have the Chernobyls of the world and Fukushima's come to mind and nuclear bombs. In this case, when this reaction occurs, my understanding, I've interviewed a couple of people working on these reactors, is that the reaction just fizzles out, it just stops. And then the it's not radioactive. So these, these, right. these are not radioactive materials that naturally decay into radioactive um, ions or, or particles that can uh, damage the body or damage uh, th these are literally just hydrogen atoms that are spun around so hot and smashed into each other. So if the machine breaks, everything just turns off. That's it. And the output, even when it's working, my understanding is some natural, uh, like just air and water. So there's yeah. no output. There's no, there's nothing correct? radioactive. There's, there's no environmental. There's nothing to and deal so, with. So let, let me fast forward 200 years. So now assume these systems work. As you guys know, all technology over time gets better, faster, cheaper, smaller. So in 200 years, we could find that we have plasma fusion reactions in every pocket, in every computer, in every phone. Imagine a world where we no longer need batteries, where we no longer need transmission lines, and where a system can literally pull hydrogen out of the air, generate electricity on the fly. And it sounds crazy, but people thought people would have never thought that the batteries that we put inside of phones would have existed when the first flow cell battery cell was made, you know, whatever, you know, during the early days of, of, uh, of chemistry, electrical chemistry. So, you know, the idea that we've been able to shrink batteries as we have, um, the, the idea that we've been able to make generators like we have today, these were concepts that would have been so foreign. So I do think that in 200 years, if plasma fusion systems work, there's nothing about the laws of physics that says they're limited in scale to only being large. They theoretically could be reduced down to there's no limit to the size they could drop down to. And so there could be a world 200 years from now where plasma fusion reactors exist in every component that needs electricity. Um, and so ultimately, you could see putting these, these systems on um, spaceships, and using them to convert elements from one form to another, and we could live for, you know, 100,000 years on a spaceship, and just recycle the elements on that spaceship to produce all our food and our air and everything. And yeah, for sure, we could get to Uranus with that. Absolutely. <laughs> and back. The summary. And back. You and could. back. You could circle his anus. So that was my diatribe on plasma fusion. I'm super excited about some of the right, progress so we're seeing. Right now, Sax is wondering, how do we wet our beaks? Just tell us where to place the bet. It's, there's nowhere yet. This is... I mean, honestly, yeah. I don't place bets on things that take 100,000 years. <laughs> it's only 100 years, Sax. Oh, 100 years. Sorry. 100,000 years. I invest in years. things that might materialize in four years. Sorry. 100 weeks. He needs to upgrade Sachs's his plane. Sax's bills are due next month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Margin call, Sax? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I got bills to pay. I got bills. <laughs> <laughs>